Okay, our next speaker is going to, will be uh, Erin Thomas uh, from White Cone, Arizona. She's a project manager for the Indian Nations Conservation Alliance. So let's uh, welcome Erin. So. Good morning, everyone. My name is Erin Thomas, and I introduced myself in Navajo because even though most of you uh, might not understand what I'm saying, um, I do it out of respect for my relatives. And I do it to show respect um, to the matriarchs, the women that I'm descended from. My first clan is Twitich Eatney, and in this picture you'll see my grandma and my little sister. My little sister here is primed to take over the ranch pretty soon, and these lambs and the sheep herd has been in our family for generations. Um, <clears throat> my second clan is Tkapaha, and that's my dad's mom. Um, that's my second clan, and um, she was also a sheep and goat rancher, and she also had cattle, and that's where my dad and me and my brother, uh, that's where we get our passion for cattle from. Um, uh, these women don't wear boots. They don't dress like I do. They don't wear cowboy hats, but they are ranchers, and I come from a long, long line of ranchers. Um, <clears throat> and they guide and inspire my work. They are the reason why I'm here today talking to you. I'm from the land. Um, I'm from northeastern Arizona on the Navajo Nation, um, from a place, a community called White Cone, Arizona. And um, I'm from, more specifically, I'm from a place called Kinjitlahe or Gooseberry Springs. And this is, this is home for me. Um, I've only ever wanted to be here. I've never wanted to live in a city, but I have. Um, I recently left my job with the NRCS to move home, um, and that's where I'm going to stay. Uh, my family and I have a deep connection to this place, um, and it tells a story of who I am and, of course, again, why I'm here. In addition to being a Navajo woman from White Cone, Arizona, I also work for Inca. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm really proud to work, work for the Indian Nations Conservation Alliance. Inca was formed in 2002 by Dick Gooby, who is a former Montana state conservationist, and he formed the Indigenous Nations Conservation Alliance to primarily support um, tribal conservation districts. Um, in 2018, Delane Atsidi became the de deputy director, and in 2019, he became the executive director. So here's Delane. I think that we have a great technical team put together. We have Delene Etsidi, who is, uh, has a background in ag business. Um, he's also a graduate from the Kingsville Ranch Management Institute. And uh, he has so much experience managing ranches, large and small. And um, he won't ever brag about himself, but I will. I'm super proud to know him and to work for him. Um, we have uh, Sadie Lister and Wallace Sosi, who've been um, creating, managing, maintaining tribal conservation districts for a long time, and they work primarily on the Navajo Nation. We have Leander Thomas, who has a background in animal science, meat science, and um, has a master's degree in ag extension education, and worked for a decade as a high school ag teacher. We have Sisto Hernandez, who um, has a background in animal science, and he also worked as a tribal rangeland manager for years. And he has a lot of connections in terms of wildlife and stuff um, that he's built up over the years with the White Mountain Apache tribe. And then we have Burdette Birding Ground, who is a uh, background in forestry, a master's in forestry and wildlife. And then uh, myself, I have a degree in range management and I worked for the NRCS for 10 years as a rangeland management specialist. So um, I'm, I'm very proud of, of the team that Delane has put together, and uh, I'm proud of the work that we do. 
In terms of the Indigenous Grazing Lands Coalition, um, this idea for a coalition was born out of a conversation that I had with Delane, like at the beginning of the year. Um, his vision was to see us open the lines of communication between tribal nations. So we've always had these historic trade routes, you might call them, where we're trading goods. Um, and he wants to open those back up again, because right now as we see it, tribes are pretty insular. We're not talking to each other. We're not working together. Um, and so his idea was to put a coalition together. Um, Delane sits on the board uh, for Nat GLC. So, you know, um, it was kind of a, that wasn't too hard of a jump. So I reached out to Monty Goya in the spring and here we are today. So it's been less than a year. One of the things that we worked on was, uh, we were gonna do a video and we were gonna do it in Navajo showing how to uh, clip um, and calculate stocking rates. That was what the initial idea was. But um, this video grew into a mini documentary and, um, we also have done um, a couple of brainstorming, you're going to see the mini documentary here in a bit, but we also have done a couple of brainstorming sessions um, where we're trying to tease out problems and tease out solutions by having conversations with uh, the people that we work with. And um, <clears throat> what we're trying to do here is with this documentary and these brainstorming sessions is start a conversation. And um, what we're trying to do is build community around these issues. Um, because we want to build genuine and authentic connections with the people that we work with. Um, and we want to build solutions from the ground up, not the other way around. And we also want to build leadership from the ground up. <clears throat> um, some key takeaways from what we've done over the past year are the one thing that we've learned is that we need to advocate for ourselves. We need to advocate to our tribal leaders and also to the general public. Um, so an example of that might be maybe we put together a media kit and send this video to our tribal leaders to educate them and start building those connections. The second takeaway is that we need simple solutions. I'm not speaking for every tribal nation or every reservation, but there's not a lot of financial wealth on tribal lands. There's not a lot of capital. Um, and so we need solutions uh, conservation practices that are low cost and low risk. We have to do what we can with what we have right now. Um, there's also really complex land ownership and land control issues that make us ineligible for USDA programs a lot of the time. And so um, we don't have we don't have that. The USDA is not coming to save us. And so um, a simple solution that I always advocate for is prescribed grazing, planned grazing, managed grazing. That's something that is usually pretty low cost and that you can do and that has a lot of benefit. So we're looking for solutions like that. The third takeaway is an overarching goal and that is to be able to leverage uh, an economy of scale among tribal nations. So as individual producers or as individual tribes, we might not have the scale to enter some cattle markets, right? But working together, we might be able to enter those markets and we might be able to be profitable at it. And then in addition, we can help each other out. You know, we can trade cattle, we can trade mutton, whatever it might be. Um, so I'm going to show a video and it's 16 minutes and hopefully we'll have enough time. But this is the result of our collaboration or partnership with not GLC. Um, and I'm going to show it without comment because I think it speaks for itself. What does the land mean to me? The land is something very sacred. The land, like it literally translates to Mother Earth. When you translate it from Navajo, that's the literal translation. I was born and raised here. I've grown up on this land. 
this is the same land that my grandparents and parents have been able to sustain their cattle operations. <laughs> it means uh, where I'm from. It's like asking someone, what do your parents mean to you? What do your uh, children mean to you? Growing up in the Navajo tradition, we are taught to have a very close relationship with the land. Our elders have taught us that we call Earth Mother Earth. It's a relationship, just like it's a relative to us. It, it kind of defines who we are as, as Hamas people. You know, we take pride in being agriculturalists. We're farmers first and foremost, but there's a few of us that do want to make a living in, in, in ranching. The scenery, I don't think, gets any better than it is. We've got the mountains to the east of us that we enjoy. We've got these areas to graze our cattle in. Our backyard is the Grand Canyon, you know. It's Mother Earth. It's what takes care of us for not only Native Americans, but everybody else. Yeah, it really changed. I used to see a lot of flowers, all different colors. And then I could see the grass so high. And then there wasn't, wasn't scarce of water. The water tank was always full. And uh, all together was a friendship with my animals, with the land, and so did my neighbors. A lot of the tribes, one of their biggest resources is, is uh, rangeland. To me, I, I think uh, over the last hundred or so years, we, we built a culture that we have pride in. You know, a lot of our tribes, like the Navajos, would, would move around at one time, you know, maybe graze over a, a 80 mile span and they would multi-species graze, not just cattle. And then once the reservation system was put into place, it, it limited them to just a few mile area. And then that's when we started running into uh, overgrazing issues. As people, as human beings, with our five fingers and the ability to walk around, we're really powerful. It's our responsibility to use that power that we have to take care of the land. It can't speak for itself. If we have too many cows out here or we're not taking care of the soil and we don't have good water, like it can't tell us that. So we have to be the ones to advocate for the land. You know, a lot of it has to do with our, our economy. You know, a lot of these tribes are facing 60 to 70% unemployment. It got us to a point now where, where we have very limited infrastructure, but we still have the natural resource. Our ancestors has left here for us what uh, God has created and the importance of um, the soil. You know, we all want development, and we want it for economic development, but we need to find a balance between conservation and preservation and protection. Everything is interconnected. Everything we do has an impact on our people. I like to think about grazing as a checkbook where your land is your money and if you're constantly withdrawing or grazing too much, you're going to overdraw. Who's going to pay for that? It'll be future generations. This land is not ours. Some of us may hold title to the land. Some of us may have it in trust. But the land really belongs to the future generations that are not born yet. We're just borrowing it for a little while. What we do to the land is what we 
get from the land. It's like reaping what we sow. But we all have to make a commitment to make sure that we're keeping and sustaining the natural resources so that way future generations can utilize the same lands. The next generation right now is uh, pretty tough. We have youth going out and getting educated, and then when they come back, there's n nobody's making room for them at the table. So in that instance, I tell them, well, you know, you got to bring your own table, <laughs> and you can, uh, you know, invite who you want there and, and start your own consulting business or farm or ranch business. It, it's going to be tough, but it's, it's doable. I think a lot of our teachings have to come from us as parents to teach our children the importance of ranching and farming. In order to see something or leave something better than you thought, you need to educate people, build a relationship with people to the point where they can have an impact in a positive way too. Having them understand what their role and responsibility is as caretakers of the land and have them understand that uh, we have a valuable place here, uh, not only here on, on Hopi, but uh, throughout the uh, United States and throughout the world. So we want to uh, make sure there's an opportunity for them in the future so they can, they can learn it and they can uh, implement it and also, you know, make an income off of it. That is one of the hardest things that we have had to deal with is overgrazing. We started getting away from the herdsman mentality. When people had sheep, they always had to have a herdsman. We start to build a, a vicious cycle. Your cattle aren't going to breed back because they don't have the nutrition to breed, breed back. What I compare it to is a tragedy of the commons. And people, in their thinking, they're like, well, I'm going to push my cattle over here and graze this area because it greens up faster than the, the higher elevations. And then everybody starts to push their cattle over there. And they overuse that area. And the healing time to grow back, it just extends it. And then they go up to the higher elevation, and then they overgraze that area. So it's just a, it's that cycle, you know, that mentality of beating everybody to the water trough. To manage your land, you have to rotate your animals. You use one area for, you know, short amounts of times, and you, you watch the feed, and you have these plans in place so you don't overuse one area, and you rotate your pastures, you rotate your cattle in that pasture for that certain amount of days. Instead of trying to fight Mother Nature, just be more in line with Mother Nature so you can have a, a better result. Sometimes you have to sell your cow. Sometimes you have to let the place rest. Some of that our great-great-grandparents understood, <laughs> but now as we get more techie and, and everything, we, we, we start to lose touch with some of that. If we can figure out a way to adapt and also incorporate some of the tribal knowledge and the land management knowledge that they have together, it would make it a lot easier. But I think we're slowly headed that way, and I think we need to not give up and keep improving on those things. You know, there's politics and everything. We're held back by laws, not only by state law, federal law, but we have tribal law. People have to learn to graze their animals together. Animals will get along. It's the people that won't get along. Your people are the hardest people to work with. Crabs in a bucket. You get put in a bucket and crabs, they're always pulling you down. Some of the problems surround the way the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Congress has regulated the Native American lands. I can remember my grandparents and, and his employees going out putting debris in washes to stop erosion. You can't do that anymore because of what it says in uh, code of reg Army Code of Regulations that you cannot stop our waterway. We need you know, approval from, from our tribal leaders and also our traditional leaders and then also the community. So they, you know, they're all on board in what we're doing and they support it. I think it's really important for our tribal governments to understand how important we think our natural resources are, especially our rangelands. We want to take care of it and we want to do a good job of being stewards to it, but we need the support of our tribal governments. What I see from the tribal government part is that the tribe has uh, spoiled them. People are overgrazing, they're mismanaging, and they're, they're, they're not paying their grazing fees. Put it back into the rangeland for, for, for water development, whatever. And I, I'm, I'm hoping for direct uh, 
opportunity for uh, individual tribal ranchers, not based upon uh, the tribal government process, but I want organizations and the federal government to understand that the individual tribal member should be able to write a grant also and receive that for the benefit of their livestock. 80% of it in turn is having a relationship with people, building relationships and networking and educating. But also the importance of working with other outside entities, the federal government, and the various different organizations that are out there that can provide opportunity to the tribal rancher. Water is life on the reservation. If we have some raindrop, we put large buckets, containers under the roof and we collect as many raindrops from the roofs to feed our animals. Precipitation really dictates how the rest of your year is or, you know, it, it, it either makes or breaks your year. I heard we've been in the drought since before I was born. They're dry. Everything's dry. But except for this windmill that we have. On our association, we get our water from 40 miles away uh, through a pipeline. Without uh, rain water, we have uh, reservoirs, earthen dams that are constructed but they're all dry, so we're totally dependent on, on uh, the transfer of water through uh, a transmission line to drinkers and, and storage tanks. I think we need to find a new way to tackle that drought and t instead of just waiting for it to be over, you know, because we could always fall into the cycle of another drought can happen, then we'd be stuck longer. Well, if all the Navajo Nation listen to each other's, and if everybody uh, works uh, toward the common goal, I think uh, er the, the lands will come back to where they, uh, they should be. With the Native Coalition, I'm, I'm hoping that we could talk in a unified voice. I think anywhere you can get a coalition or an alliance together, you know, there's, there's strength in numbers. Making sure that we're educating each other. So when we have ranchers come together, that we're all sharing information and we're empowering ourselves to make good decisions into the future. I think forming a coalition would be something beneficial to us so that we can um, advocate for ourselves and advocate for conservation on tribal lands and advocate for fair marketing of our, our meat products. As knowledge spreads and people are kind of opening up and to uh, take on what's probably new to us but has been part of the industry elsewhere for a long time, then that can open up markets for us. But the only way for us to hit that critical number is to have people work together. Help them understand that they do have a quality product if we can get it to the market. Every organization is beneficial dependent on whether it meets its goal. Working with all of the other coalitions and other organizations that are out there is key. Not just the intellectual property that's passed down from one generation to the other, but the importance of science. In today's society, the way we move as fast as we're moving, it's important to have good sound practices based upon science. Being able to use all of our knowledge that we have now and the knowledge that we're going to collect to have a foundation where people and our children can actually don't have to start as low as where we started from the beginning processes where they can take off from where we ended. So you know everybody has a piece to the puzzle whether it's you know, throughout the, the, the United States, all of our tribal nations own, own a piece to the puzzle. And once we start to solve the puzzle and put it into, you know, put it into place and we, we realize, you know, what our overall goal is, I think that'll help everyone. You know, the best way I think I want to leave this land for the future uh, ranchers and so forth is just making sure that I do everything possible now to, to make it an easy transition for, for new ranchers down the road, whether it be my son or 
our other producers' kids, you know, we want to make sure that they're set up to to continue the the legacy of of, of ranching on on tribal lands. Well, that's one of the first products that we've had um, um, with the Not GLC partnership, and I'm really proud of that video. Um, really quickly. Uh, for 2021, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy, is now recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. So what's next for us? We're gonna to continue to have con conversations with the people that we work with. We're, Inca is planning a whole suite of events for 2022. They'll be online and virtual. We're looking to identify people to develop a leadership board for our coalition. And we're hoping to determine how we're gonna do business as an organization. Um, are we gonna stay under the umbrella of Inca? Or are we gonna branch out on our own? We also want to pr prioritize a needs analysis, um, and our needs analysis right now has three components. What do we have control over? What do we have not have control over, but can influence, and what do we not have control over? So anything that we don't have control over is off the table for now. Um, and then we're going to things that we have control over, like prescribed grazing and Inca's ability to do training on that is something that we have control over. Um, and maybe we send this video to our our, our tribal leaders um, to, to get their influence. While we can't control them, we can let them know what we think. Um, you know, how we've done that, you know, we've uh, reached out to NatGLC, we've formed this partnership. The hardest part, I think, is going to be creating buy-in from tribes. Um, that's the most complicated and complex thing that we can do, but I think that the staff at Inca is primed to be able to do that because of our backgrounds, our education, and our knowledge of the ecosystem of managing tribal lands, federal lands, all of that stuff. Um, we'll continue to cultivate partnerships. There's people all around the world that are doing amazing things in conservation, and we hope to make connections with them. Um, and then we're gonna always continue to seek feedback um, through having conversations and also through uh, more formal means like surveys. I wanna end this presentation with gratitude um, I'd like to thank the National Coalition, uh, not GLC, um, uh, for inviting me here and having me speak. Um, to I want to acknowledge the Lynn and Hezekiah Gibson um, Memorial Scholarship. Uh, they're one of the reasons why I'm here today, and I'm proud to represent that this year. Uh, the NCBA, they have also uh, are one of the reasons that I'm here today. Um, and then I'd also like to thank my brother Wade. <laughs> Uh, he took the week off to be here. Um, it's hard being away from home for a week uh, by yourself, so I'm glad that he's here. And he also represents uh, a beginning farmer and rancher. Now, we all talk about wanting to support our young farmers and ranchers, and here's one, so give him all your support. Um, and it's also always important for me to acknowledge family support. You know, that's why I think we all do what we do. So. Um, feel free to reach out to myself. There's my email address. Reach out to Delane. Um, there's his email address. And thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> we'll take a couple questions. Oh, sure. We'll take a couple questions if. Uh... Sure. Oh, of course. Um, the federal recognition, you're, you're our relatives. And you know, the, um, yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, I, I encourage you, I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards and, and we can get you involved for sure. Any other quick questions? That was a great video, Aaron. So let's give Aaron another hand. <laughs> <laughs>